For 60 million years, these forests have evolved in isolation. For all that time, the great island of Madagascar has drifted alone through the Indian Ocean. There are 28 species of lemur on Madagascar, and none of them can be found anywhere else on Earth. In fact, most of the mammals and almost all the reptiles on the island are unique. So too are more than 80% of the plants in the Malagasy rainforest. It's one of the world's great storehouses of genetic diversity. Botanist Pierre-Jules Rakutamalaza and his partner have been hired by the Worldwide Fund for Nature to do a stock take. Painstakingly, they're collecting, identifying and listing every species of plant in a single hectare of forest. It's a slow job, but they can't afford to take too long because the forest is disappearing faster than they can identify what it contains. A few months ago, the Rambaliala family chopped down a hectare of forest and burned the dried out foliage. In the fertile ashes, they planted their rice. And now in late May, they're harvesting. But Jonas Pierre knows that the soil won't stay fertile for long. The destruction of new forest is steady and remorseless. Human beings first arrived in Madagascar only 1,500 years ago, steering their outrigger canoes across the Indian Ocean from the rice lands of Southeast Asia. Since then, they've slashed and burned their way across the island. Three quarters of the original forest has gone. And with it, the fragile topsoil, washed by the rain into the rivers and by the rivers into the ocean. Most of the rainforest that remains is in the remotest parts of the country. From the airport on the tourist island of Nosi Bay, off the northwest coast of Madagascar, it's a two-hour boat trip to the mainland. We're going to visit a unique pilot project in the hills. According to its creator, it offers the only hope of stopping the destruction. Dr. Nat Kwanza was born in Ghana in West Africa and trained as a botanist in London. He first fell in love with Madagascar when he came here as a student. He's no fan of the traditional approach to conservation. Trying to fence the forest off from the people, he says, just won't work in the long run. People are made for nature, nature is made for people. And until we learn to make that too work in a balanced equation, we are not going to get anywhere. Nat Kwanza needed a place for his experiment that was still remote from the modern world. And he found it. It's only 70 kilometers from our landing place on the coast to the village of Ambudisikwana in the hills. But National Highway 6, the main road south to the capital, is no superhighway. 
And this was the end of the rainy season. As darkness fell, so did the rain. Three hours later, we finally extracted the Land Rover. It wasn't until four the next morning that we reached the end of the road. Even here, in the remote hills, the forest has been cleared and burnt by the rice farmers. Not once, but time and again. But high up on the mountain slopes, great swathes of primary forest remain untouched. And just as important for Nat Quantz's project, the ties between the people and the forest haven't yet been broken. I'm doing this project with this hypothesis that if the lives of the people and the habitats or the biodiversity around them are interwoven, are intricately interwoven. And those people's life depend on this biodiversity, then those people also will happily or willingly take up the responsibility to save those resources. Yeah. Pimpil Wuitri, Atawani Fanafud. Ndranala is a traditional healer. He knows the medicinal properties of hundreds of species of plant and fungus, knowledge that's been accumulated for a thousand years and more. When Nat Kwanza found Ndranala, it looked as though his precious knowledge might never be passed on. The church regarded him as a witch. The doctors dismissed him as a quack. The people were beginning to turn away from his traditional remedies. But for Nat Kwanza, those remedies were the key to his new approach to conservation. The people using plants for medicine is the link between them and nature. And it's a strong link because if you are ill, you can't do anything. If you are strong and healthy, you can do lots of things. <laughs> In the village of Ambudisikwana, Nat Kwanza set out to strengthen that link still further. With the help of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, he set up a most unusual health clinic. For a 70-year-old, Joseph Manaparana is pretty fit but he's been suffering from stomach pains. A few years ago, he would have had to travel 80 kilometers, a third of it on foot, to reach the nearest clinic. Now he can find a doctor just by crossing the river. There's always a fully qualified GP, like Dr. Carl Randriambolalona, on duty at the clinic. See? But twice a week, he finds himself sharing his examination room with an illiterate traditional healer. Together, doctor and healer make their diagnosis and agree on treatment. The rule is that whenever possible, the drugs will come from Undranova's pharmacy in the forest. Stick and leaf, bark and root, fruit and flower. Gradually, the healer's vast store of knowledge is being passed on to the doctors. Dr. Randrian Bulolona and his colleagues were trained to prescribe the expensive pills and potions of Western medicine. At first, they regarded these traditional remedies with suspicion. It's true that there are traditional practitioners who were at our side, but we didn't have confidence. Puis, au fur et à mesure que l'on a vu l'efficacité de la plante, on a commencé à, à se rassurer donc 
puis en ce moment, on n'a pas peur de, de prescrire les plantes. Vous-même, vous êtes convaincu On est convaincu. On est convaincu. But the flow of knowledge isn't all one way. 600 kilometers to the south, in the capital, Antananarive, the traditional cures of the forest are refined by modern science. This part of the project is led by the first Malagasy woman to qualify as a pharmacologist, Nat Kwanza's wife, Patricia. She and her students are finding cheap and practical ways to improve the efficiency of Undranala's treatments. The juice of these berries is an effective remedy for cough and fever, but the tree from which they come fruits only once a year. The distilled oil from the berries can be stored and used all year round. We try to help the people to convince them that the medicinal plant that they have in the rainforest can cure them. So they, they now uh, understand better their relationship with the um, forest, and they know that they, their life depends on the forest, and they are ready to conserve the forest. It's no quick fix solution. But Nat Kwanza insists that the clinic is transforming attitudes in Manangarif. <laughs> Respect for old Undranala, the traditional healer, has increased dramatically since the clinic came, and the forest is already benefiting. But so far, that ban applies only to the small portion of the forest which is Andranala's medicine chest. Elsewhere, not much has changed as yet. Jonas Pierre Rambialala still intends to cut and burn a new plot for his family's rice fields in two years' time. And he's the headman of Ambudisikwana village. <laughs> Rice and the way it's grown is still the fundamental problem. Nat Kwanza's project is studying how Jonas Pierre can feed his family without cutting down hectares of forest to do it. But the health clinic was the community's first priority. And so, Kwanza insists, it had to be his too. The project agreed to meet the community's priority, make that priority as the project's priority. And in listening to their point of view, you build confidence, you build trust. And once that trust is built, it becomes easier to talk off and discuss things and find solutions to other problems. The slash and burn is a problem. Meeting them on their health point has made it easier for us to try and meet them on that agricultural front. If we can save the biodiversity of Madagascar through making the people themselves want to save it, there is a lot for the people themselves and for the world. At the current rate, all of Madagascar's forests will be gone in 30 years. On its own, a project like Nat Kwanza's is too small to make a dent in the destruction. But in one respect at least, he's surely right. The humans of Madagascar are threatening the existence of most of its other inhabitants. Only the humans of Madagascar can take on the responsibility for saving them.